What is up my peeps and chooms? So a few times on my channel, I have had people ask me whether or not there is a link between hair loss and smoking. And by smoking, I'm talking about cigarette smoking. I'm not talking about marijuana, not kratom, not meth, not crack. Those are maybe subjects for a different video. This is an interesting subject for me in particular because you'd think there already are enough reasons for people to avoid or quit smoking, but if we can find out if hair loss is yet another intrinsic motivator for people to give up this degenerate addiction, then all the better. So. As you guys may have already guessed by now, I am not a fan of smoking. I think it shows poor judgment and short-sightedness. I know people who start will frequently tell themselves that they smoke because they don't care if they die 20 or 30 years down the road, but you never hear them saying they're okay with dying once they actually develop a health problem like heart disease or lung cancer. No, they're screaming, help me, help me, as soon as they get some sort of disease and they expect everybody to show them sympathy, even though they spent their whole lives claiming not to give a fuck about the damage they're doing to themselves via smoking. Furthermore, I think smoking makes men look really like weak and effeminate pussies. It doesn't seem this way if you have seen how smoking is portrayed in cinema and other mediums of entertainment, especially in classic cinema where you have alpha male actors like Frank Sinatra or Clint Eastwood who smoke, or even in some contemporary mediums of entertainment like video games such as in the Yakuza or Metal Gear Solid series where the lead characters often smoke and are still portrayed as the absolute pinnacle of masculinity and badassness, but when you look past the commercialism and media glamour, it look and you just take a look at how smokers actually are, you see that most of them are pretty pitiful, especially the ones who struggle so much with their addiction that they cannot even get through like a single movie without having to take a smoke break, or people who go to the gym and then have to leave in the middle of their workout to smoke. It's pretty pathetic. I mean, I really, there really is nothing quite as paltry and pitiable as seeing someone who is a slave to addiction, especially when the health detriments of smoking are just so well documented and verified by medical research today, yet still somehow this isn't enough evidence to convince people that smoking is a bad idea. However, I have to say that as idiotic of a decision as smoking is, I still can't be too judgmental as I think the majority of people who start smoking started when they were teenagers and heaven forbid everyone has made stupid decisions or believe stupid things at that age. Sadly, by the time they are old enough to know better, they are already hooked and I can only imagine how difficult it is for someone to quit a substance as addictive as nicotine, but if the negative reinforcement of heart disease and cancer is enough, what about hair loss? Is there any evidence-based research that points to a correlation between tobacco addiction and hair loss. Well, fortunately, there is some data, in fact, that addresses this question, so let's go ahead and examine this research, break it down, and see what we can conclude from all this data. So the first source I found is from a fellow named Dr. Truib. If that name sounds familiar to you, then chances are you've seen my videos done on post-finasteride syndrome, where I referenced a study he oversaw where he helped prove that post-finasteride syndrome is little more than a nocebo effect driven by mass hysteria and knocked back by any real scientific research whatsoever, and his work really helped pioneer the way for skeptics such as myself to fight back against the anti-finasteride gaslighting that plagues the internet today. So, as you could imagine, I was genuinely excited when I found out that he also researched the subject of hair loss as it relates to smoking. As it turns out, though, even though I only found out about this editorial by Truib recently, it was published way back in 2003, and the title is, quote, Association Between Smoking and Hair Loss, Another Opportunity for Health Education Against Smoking, unquote. Unfortunately, the complete editorial is hidden behind a paywall, but the gist of it is, is that that there is an association between smoking and baldness, and that is demonstrated through various mechanisms, and Dr. Trub even went so far as to suggest that the link to hair loss could be used as a tool in anti-smoking campaigns, which I thought it was funny because it kind of reminded me of Dr. Deal Neil Bernard when he said something similar. What he said was that um, when he brought up the link between high serum cholesterol and heart disease, nobody would listen to him, but as soon as he brought up the link between a high serum cholesterol and erectile 
erectile dysfunction, then he immediately had everybody's attention. And I think it's funny because uh, I just feel that death is one of those things we use, uh, we, we kind of just don't think about as a coping me mechanism. And until we actually get some warning signs that is going to happen, uh, we just uh, kind of put it off. And hair loss is uh, similar in that regard. Many of us never even thought about hair loss until it actually started happening to us. And you know, nothing breaks cognitive dissonance about hair loss more than that first time somebody asked you if your hair is thinning or if your hairline is receding. That's when shit gets real. But anyways, getting back to the study by Dr. Trueb, he found that smoking promotes hair loss in ways that are both independent from antrianic alopecia as well as ways directly related to antrianic alopecia. The first way is through direct damage to the microvasculature of the dermal hair papilla cells. So to explain what this means, each one of your hair follicles is its own individual organ that has its own blood supply. When antrogenic alopecia, uh, also known as hair loss, occurs, it is because of the trash hormone DHT, dihydrotestosterone, attacking the hair follicle in men who are genetically predisposed to antrogenic alopecia. When this happens, IGF-1 on the scalp decreases, and this in turn eventually causes the hair follicle to die and be replaced by collagen deposits like scar tissue because IGF-1 is what helps regulate angiogenesis, which is the creation of new blood vessels to the hair follicles. So when DHT attaches to the androgen receptor on the hair follicle, it signals a chain of biochemical events that eventually leads to the irreversible destruction of the hair follicle as it is starved of blood. Now remember, blood is still flowing to the scalp just fine, even in men who have androgenic alopecia. If you put a scalpel to a bald man's scalp, it will bleed all over the place. Believe me, it is not just going directly to the hair follicles is the problem in the case of men who have androgenic alopecia. So a good way to think of it, a good analogy to use, be... Uh, like think of it like trying to spray a fire hose on a building to try to put out a fire that's inside a building, but the windows are closed. I mean, you can put all the water you want on the building, but if it's not getting inside the building where the fire is, you're not going to be treating the problem. So you can have all the blood supply up there you need, but if there are no capillaries providing blood to the hair follicle, then it dies. So that is something uh, you need to keep in mind, and that's why you shouldn't be fooled when someone tries to sell you a product promising to regrow hair on the premise that in improves blood flow to the scalp. I mean, if it were that simple, then cardiovascular training and blood pressure medications would, ca would uh, help stop hair loss, I should say. So in the case of smoking, none of the chemicals are androgens, so it isn't androgenic like dihydrotestosterone, but it still, interestingly enough, causes damage to the hair follicle in a way that is reminiscent of DHT, at least to some extent. Although keep in mind, this report from Truob is just a summary of the basic science data. It isn't a randomized control trial with any subjects, although don't worry I'll be getting to that soon, but we're not done with the theoretical damage smoking you do to the hair. Cigarette smoke, as many of you guys already know, is loaded with carcinogens, and carcinogens are chemicals that damage the DNA in our cells. If the DNA is damaged enough, the cells turn into cancer cells, but cancer cells are not. Any DNA damage interferes with cellular function, and of course, a very important function of the hair dermal papilla cells is to grow hair. So this is another mechanism for smoking interfering with healthy hair growth. He also also mentions that cigarette smoke causes an imbalance in the protease antiprotease system, which is a pair of enzymatic systems that are crucial to the hair growth cycle and have a lot to do with hair shedding. Now, I don't want to get into all the details of which there are many, but I'll link an article that talks about these effects if you are interested. But what is more important to that, I think, is what he mentions about the pro-oxidant effects of smoking that causes the release of inflammatory cytokines that result in microinflammation and fibrosis of the hair follicles. Now, cytokines have picked up some attention in the media recently thanks to the Kamikov, and that is because cytokines are substances released by the immune system of the body in response to any kind of attack on the body, whether it be through a virus like the Kamikov or the ingestion of dangerous chemicals that are found in cigarettes like nicotine. They cause inflammation and have even caused death in some people infected with the Wuhu virus, and that includes children, sadly. Now, as it relates to hair loss, these cytokines cause inflammation in the hair follicle, which in turn can cause hair loss. Now, 
I'm not talking about the kind of uh, acute inflammation you see with things like scalp dermatitis. I mean, that definitely doesn't help with hair loss, but scalp dermatitis isn't generally seen as a big risk for hair loss. The type of inflammation you get from smoking is more chronic and the more prolonged type of damage that smoking causes and which can accumulate over time and cause scar tissue, which effectively replaces your follicle and turns you into a slaphead by replacing all those hair with scar tissue. So it seems even though you do see people with a full head of hair who are smokers, there does seem to be evidence that smoking damages the hair follicles, and furthermore, it seems to also cause damage to the hair follicles in a way that is directly related to antrinic alopecia. And that leads to the final mechanism that Dr. Trua brings up, and that is that smoking causes an increased hydroxylation of estradiol, which basically means estradiol is inactivated more quickly, and it also inhibits the enzyme aromatase, which converts some of the testosterone of men to a small amount of estrogen. Now, testosterone at baseline levels is not something to be concerned about. It's only when testosterone is at super physiological levels, like if you're using steroids where you need to be worried, and I talk about this in my testosterone and hair loss video. Uh, but the important thing about estrogen on the scalp is that it works as an indirect anti-androgen, meaning it suppresses testosterone. And less testosterone means less testosterone to convert into DHT via the 5A reductase enzyme. <clears throat> So by reducing estrogen and the aromatase enzyme via smoking, the net effect of these two actions is to increase the amount of DHT around the hair follicles, which of course is not a good thing if you have androgenic alopecia. And I should also point out that in addition to being an indirect anti-androgen, estrogen has also been shown to be a good hair growth stimulant in its own right, and I talk about this more in my estrogen and hair growth video, which I recommend watching, and I'll go ahead and link that one below in case you haven't seen it yet. So of course, this is all theory, and even though this is a very good summary by Dr. Trub, in my opinion, it doesn't have any outcome data, so it isn't anything we can draw any conclusions from. So the question remains, is there any research out there that has any real outcome data in smokers with androgenic alopecia? Is there a connection between smoking and androgenic alopecia in real life? Fortunately, the answer is a resounding yes. There is an excellent study from 2007 out of Taiwan that addresses these questions, and normally I would have just talked about this study, but I thought an overview of some of the theoretical methods mechanisms were interesting enough to point out as well. So even though androgenic alopecia has a lower prevalence in East Asia, at least that's how it seems, it does nevertheless seem that a lot of studies on androgenic alopecia have been done in Asia, which is interesting, but you know, baldness is a disease we should all hate and try to destroy regardless of our ethnicity, right? So in the introduction to the study, the authors quote three previous studies of the association between smoking and androgenic alopecia and note that the results were inconsistent. One study showed a positive association, one study did not show a positive association, and one study showed a statistically insignificant negative association. So like many of the dark corners of hair loss research, the data was inconclusive. So these researchers in Taiwan sought to do a better study to address this, and their study turned out to be much more definitive than any of the earlier studies uh, done on the subject. So what they did is they got subjects for the study by looking at all male residents who were 40 years of age or older in a specific county called Tining County in Taiwan, aka Good China. Fortunately, most people in Asia already smoke like chimneys, so they had no trouble getting a large sample size of subjects. Specifically, there were 924 subjects who were surveyed, and the response rate to the survey was about 80%, which is pretty high. So that's 740 men who were included in the study. Amazingly, each one of these men was examined by public health nurses trained by a dermatologist to determine their degree of hair loss. So this study was definitely not cheap. It was definitely more comprehensive and several steps above uh, any of the research that HairGuard uses for his Blutflu product. Products. So anyways, they used the traditional Norwood scale, though on some med with diffuse hair loss, they used the Ludwig scale, which is used by women traditionally for androgenic alopecia, although men can suffer hair loss in this pattern too, and the cause is still the same, androgenic alopecia. It's just in the case of diffuse thinners, their hair follicles are programmed to respond to DHT a little bit differently. But anyways, to show you what proportion of people suffer from what degree of hair loss and at what age, you can look at this table, which shows the breakdown of hair loss in all 740 subjects subdivided by 
by age. And overall, this is a very diverse population, even though it is limited to men over 40, which is strange uh, initially, since there are plenty of men who can start balding at half that age. But I think the reason why they chose 40 is because they wanted to make sure the subjects had been smoking for a long time to better understand the kind of chronic damage cigarette smoking does to the hair follicles. In addition to the classification of androgenic alopecia they collected, uh, they also got information about the age of onset of androgenic alopecia and smoking status on the subjects, of which they were very detailed on. I mean, they even accounted for variables like whether or not they were currently smoking or had quit or and resumed smoking at any point in their lives. And they also looked at other factors like obesity and hypertension. And they also drew blood and measured blood glucose. They measured triglycerides, cholesterol, and specifically they measured LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. And they even looked at things like socioeconomic factors, family history of baldness, alcohol use, as well as something called betel nut chewing, which I had never even heard of until now. But apparently what it is is that it's some sort of natural drug that is abused in China that is like smoking in the sense that it is also a carcinogen which can cause health problems. So overall, this was a very detailed study. They left out no details. And it kind of makes you wonder how a society that takes science seriously when it comes to smoking and hair loss still has a culture that believes that eating parts from critically endangered animals like rhino horn, shark fin, tiger penises, bats, and pangolins can cure every disease under the sun. It makes you wonder how they can believe in such things still. But anyways, what were the results? Again, there were 740 men with ages ranging from 40 to 91 years of age, and the average age was 65 years. Figure 1 here shows that the prevalence of androgenic alopecia increased with age, which is not surprising as we know hair loss gets worse as we get older. And here in figure two, they compare the prevalence of androgenic alopecia with age of the study and with a bunch of other studies. And again, no surprise, androgenic alopecia prevalence increases with age, so this gives us similar results to figure one, though they did find that more mild androgenic alopecia, like Norwood 3 or less, as well as female pattern hair loss, did not increase with age, which is interesting as some people hypothesize that hair loss can stabilize with some people who have mild androgenic alopecia, although you should never assume this will happen to you. I mean, always assume the worst and get on finasteride but now i'm getting off topic so let's get back on topic and get back to what we were talking about with smoking and in this huge table which i'll leave up for a bit so you guys can get a good look at it they list all the risk factors they examine examine but here's the bottom line Smokers were at increased risk of having moderate or severe androgenic alopecia, meaning Norwood 4 or more. Pulling the numbers from Table 2, former or current smokers had a 1.61 times chance of having androgenic alopecia versus non-smokers. The p-value was 0.03, which means this is a real association. The only other factors with a p-value less than 0.05 were family history of androgenic alopecia and age. So for those who don't know... A what a p-value is. A p-value of less than 0.05 basically means it is very unlikely that the results of the study occurred by chance. So looking at a p-value is a good way to measure the quality of an outcome-based study. So they found these p-values by using what is called a univariate analysis, where they look at each risk factor separately. They then did what's called a multivariate analysis, where they try to adjust for risk factors interfering with each other. For example, suppose the smokers were more likely to be old. In that case, maybe it was their age that was causing the association with smoking and not the smoking itself. Fortunately, there are statistical techniques to assess each risk factor on its own and cancel out the other risk factors. This is what the multivariate analysis does. With this analysis, there was an association between moderate to severe androgenic alopecia and smoking status, as well as current cigarette smoking of 20 or more cigarettes per day, which I think is about a pack or something. There was also an association with smoking intensity, meaning number of cigarettes smoked times how many years of smoking and with abnormal lipid levels after adjusting for age and family history of androgenic alopecia. They then looked at the early onset of androgenic alopecia. Early onset of, onset of androgenic alopecia was associated with more severe androgenic alopecia, as you might expect. I mean, if you get it when you're young, you're going to get it w much worse, which is why young men should not fear finasteride. They should get on it as soon as possible. And they also found that men with a family history of androgenic alopecia 
were also more likely to have this early onset androgenic alopecia, although this shouldn't be seen as bulletproof as evidence, as it is still possible to get the slaphead gene, even if your parents don't have it. I mean, I've met many people who say that, like, you know, they're going bald even though their parents aren't bald, and it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's... Uh, I shouldn't be seen as a sure bet. But interestingly, in this specific study, on the subject of family history, it seemed like baldness on the father's side of the family was more closely linked to androgenic alopecia than on the mother's side. Even though there is a very common urban legend that we inherit baldness from our mother's side, which isn't true. I mean, it can come from either parent. However, these findings about family history don't really have anything to do with smoking, but are interesting nevertheless, and they are laid out in Table 3. So anyways... In their discussion, they compare the overall incidence of androgenic alopecia with previous studies and note that it was similar to the studies from Good Korea, but the incidence of androgenic alopecia was lower than in the studies of white Caucasian men, which is no surprise because, you know, bald men in Asia are about as common as science classrooms in Alabama. But the big finding in this study, though, is the clear association between cigarette smoking and androgenic alopecia. They compared their study to three previous studies that gave inconclusive results, and the bottom line is that the methodology of this study is much better than the earlier studies. They then go over the mechanisms of damage to the hair that smoking causes, and these are the same that Truib mentioned in his editorial, which helps confirm his findings. Finally, they talk a bit about the genetic factors that they uncovered, especially since, like I said earlier, at least in this study, it shows that the fathers may be more important than the mother's side, but I really think we need another study to confirm this, as this seems somewhat counterintuitive, even if it is possible. But overall, this was an excellent study with a large patient population and also had very good methodology. And, you know, as always, you know, more research wouldn't hurt, but the bottom line is that pretty much every negative thing you can imagine happening to the body, smoking helps contribute to it. So it is no surprise that smoking, and particularly heavy smoking, make androgenic alopecia even worse. So if you have or are at risk of androgenic alopecia, the best thing is to never start smoking to begin with. Hell, even if you don't have androgenic alopecia, you shouldn't smoke because it makes you look like a tool. I mean, if you are a smoker, you should quit. And I know that is not an easy thing to ask of people, but your hair, your health, fuck even your life is on the line. So it isn't a matter of whether or not you can. You must quit. You don't have a choice. So I'd go ahead and add androgenic alopecia to yet another thing we can add to the immensely long list of bad effects smoking has on people. Not, and you know, not to downplay the dangers of COVID-19, but the American Cancer Association states that smoking causes one out of five deaths in the U.S. each year. I mean, it is the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. and smoking causes many forms of cancer, especially lung cancer. It also causes chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, bronchitis, emphysema, coronary heart disease heart attacks, strokes, peripheral vascular disease, aneurysms, miscarriages, premature delivery, deliveries, uh, erectile dysfunction, reduced fertility, diabetes, gum disease, skin aging, etc., etc. And now finally, we can also add androgenic alopecia to the list. So before I go, I don't want any smokers who watch my videos to get the impression that I think lowly of them. I mean, I don't hate smokers. I, the only smokers I probably do hate, though, are the real pretentious ones who act like they're victims and treat their fight, or treat their right to feed their addiction as if it's the modern-day civil rights movement. But I do hope, having watched my video, you've been given a further incentive to break your habit because, you know, let's face it, being bald is a death sentence. So, all right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. I am not going to be too active on YouTube for the the next couple of days, although I do have a project later this week, so stay tuned. I will be back uh, with more content soon, but for tonight, I'm probably going to be watching the Senate elections in Georgia, and if you happen to live in Georgia and you haven't voted yet, then go ahead and do so, uh, but until then, I hope you guys have a great day. God bless.